Like his father, he seemed destined to serve the ruling powers. His family belonged to the Bania caste, hard-working merchants from western Gujarat state. Gandhi's marriage at the age of 13 was arranged. He and his wife Kasturba would have four children. When he was 16, his father fell gravely ill. Gandhi's biographers describe him as a devoted son who sat at his father's bedside. Gandhi felt that he had a duty to nurse his father at the time he, he was dying and hopefully he wanted to actually be with him at the hour of his death. Um, but on that particular day when his father became critically ill, he um, felt uh, more attracted to his wife and he was actually in, in the act of making love to her uh, at the moment when his father died. Uh, and it's a, a lot of historians who've looked at Gandhi uh, Gandhi's life feel that this uh, was really something that uh, coloured his whole attitude um, to, to his sexuality uh, and led eventually to his deciding to renounce all a uh, sexual relationship with his wife. After passing his bar exams in London, Gandhi returned to India to practice law, but soon went on to take up a short-term position in South Africa. He ended up staying for 20 years. Initially, uh, in his early years, um, Gandhi uh, in South Africa uh, had lived the life of a, of a rich lawyer. He'd had a, quite an affluent lifestyle. He hadn't really changed, uh, become this very ascetic person uh, dressing in, in hand-spun clothes and so on. He was wearing Western-style suits. He was living well. But then, on a train journey to Pretoria, a white passenger objected to Gandhi's presence in a first-class carriage. And though he had a first-class ticket, he was thrown off the train. He resolved to stay and fight for Indian equality in South Africa. When he returned to India in 1915, Gandhi was a changed man. The barrister had become a political activist. Trading his English suit and tie for a dhoti, the traditional dress of the Indian poor, he set out to familiarize himself with the social problems in his homeland traveling by train across the country, always in third class. The movement for Indian independence was gaining momentum. Gandhi addressed crowds in every town and village he visited. He spoke of human dignity, justice and independence. Across the country, nationalists organized bonfire protests to burn textiles imported from England. Gandhi launched his charka, or spinning wheel movement. He declared it the patriotic duty of every Indian to spin 200 yards of cotton thread a day and to boycott textiles produced in the mills of Manchester and Liverpool. But it did become a symbol um, of, of a commitment to the nationalist cause to every, every morning to sit down and to get out your spinning wheel and to spin your uh, cotton thread. Uh, and they became very skillful at it. You know, they would spend hours every day doing this. And Gandhi saw this as something which was, um, was, was almost a spiritual task of, of, of spinning, you know, for the good of the nation. In 1930, Gandhi led the three-week Salt March, walking 358 kilometers to the village of Dandi on the Arabian Sea, where he defied the British salt monopoly by lifting and auctioning off a fistful of salt. Gandhi and his followers were arrested, but it was a victory for the man who Churchill contemptuously called the half-naked fakir. Coverage of the march captured the world's attention. Gandhi had an innate sense of symbolism and mass communication. 
This seems like a contradiction, paradoxical for a man who came across as an ascetic, as someone who renounced worldly things in search of spiritual salvation. But he was a great politician and a great communicator. Mais c'est un grand homme politique, c'est un grand communicant. Gandhi's weapons were civil disobedience and non-violent resistance. The British countered with truncheons. Colonial repression was often brutal. Prisons were full. Gandhi was jailed seven times for a total of four years. His protege, Jawaharlal Nehru, eight times, serving nine years. From the beginning to the end, the struggle for independence was led by the Indian National Congress Party. Gandhi was its guiding light, Nehru its chief organizer. The two men shared a deep bond, even if they didn't always see eye to eye. Gandhi, from a traditional merchant family, now an ascetic clothed in a dhoti. Nehru, the anglicized Brahmin, well-dressed and elegant, with ideas rooted in socialism. Somebody like Nehru, who embraced socialism in the 1920s, um, Gandhi was prepared to tolerate that, because he believed that, uh, that Nehru would always basically be loyal to him. Um, so that he, he, he gave Nero a sort of certain amount of rope, you could say, um, you know, to go his own way. But Gandhi would always be holding it and able to draw him in uh, whenever he felt, you know, he was going to to, to, to great an extreme. And, and, and Nero, well, he was a, he, he knew, you know, that he was, it was in his interest to keep in with Gandhi, but he also had a genuine affection for Gandhi. Um, Nero's own father had died in um, 1931. Uh, and in, in many respects, you can see Gandhi as sort of as, as taking over that uh, position of, of, of the father figure for Nehru. Uh, and so that they do have a very close relationship despite their differences. The two men were very different, not least in their views on religion. Nehru was a self-professed atheist, something rare in a country where refusing to express religious belief is a taboo. Gandhi was deeply religious. He began each meeting with prayers. Life in India is permeated by the values of Hinduism, which assigns a person's caste on the basis of birth. But Hinduism has been traditionally regarded as a tolerant religion, not given to proselytizing. Islam had expanded under the reign of the Mughal emperors in northern India to become the country's second largest religion. In British India, Muslims accounted for a quarter of the population. After the country's partition in 1947, that number dropped to 12%. Hindus and Muslims had long enjoyed a peaceful coexistence until political representation was attached to religious identity. The Muslim League emerged as a political force in the 1930s with the aim of protecting the interests of Indian Muslims. But a new goal emerged, the creation, after Britain's withdrawal from India, of a Muslim nation, Pakistan, or land of the pure. The party was led by Muhammad Ali Jinnah, who'd known Gandhi for years. Both Gandhi and Jinnah came from Gujarat. They were Gujarati-speaking people. Uh, they were both lawyers who'd been educated in London, had received their legal training there. So in a way, there was, they had a lot in common. Uh, but unfortunately, they came into very sharp conflict quite early on after Gandhi returned to India. 
In 1944, Gandhi went to meet Jinnah at his private residence in Bombay. Over the course of almost three weeks, Gandhi tirelessly tried to dissuade Jinnah from his plan for a Muslim Pakistan. He assured him that Muslims would have an honorable place in a secular and democratic India. He even offered him the post of Prime Minister in independent India's first government. Jinnah couldn't stand the affection and attention he was shown by Gandhi, because like many Muslims, he viewed it as a patronizing attempt by Hindus to assimilate Muslims. Gandhi saw himself as a universalist. He didn't want to be seen as Hindu, but as Indian. Yet everything about his style, his dress, was typically Hindu. His embrace of renunciatory disciplines and linking of ascetic practice with political aspirations, all that created the impression of a quintessential Hindu. Shimla, the summer capital of British India. In 1946, the leaders of the Muslim League and Indian Congress Party met here to discuss ways to implement Gandhi's vision of a united, independent India. Nehru's knack for diplomacy failed in the face of Jinnah's intransigence. After three weeks, the talks broke down. Jinnah's campaign centered on a single topic. Congress was a Hindu party with a Hindu leader. If Hindus won the first elections after independence, Muslims would face assimilation and oppression. To survive, they needed their own state, Pakistan. So, um, in, in 1946, he decides to take the matter to the streets. Uh, Jinnah had been a strictly constitutional politician before then. He'd been loyal to the British. He hadn't ever been involved in civil disobedience campaigns. He'd never adopted the sort of ta tactics that Gandhi had uh, adopted. But in 1946, in August 1946, he decides to take the issue to the street. He's going to show the power of Muslims in India. And he has the direct action day. Jinnah's call for a direct action day on August 16, 1946, in support of the demand for Pakistan, sparked an eruption of harrowing violence in Calcutta. 5,000 people were massacred and 20,000 wounded. Most of the victims were Hindu. That led to retaliatory attacks by Hindus against Muslims elsewhere. Reprisal killings spread across northern India. Entire families were slaughtered. Some Hindus now claimed their religion was too passive and lacked martial ardor. To them, the Hindu value of tolerance was an inexcusable weakness, which had for centuries allowed first the Mughal and then the British empires to enslave the Hindu majority. They felt the time had come for Hindus to assert themselves and for Hindu men to reclaim their prowess. They wanted to reform Hinduism and boost Hindus' moral and physical strength. In every town and village where the movement had a local chapter, activists convened mornings and evenings for ideological training and physical drills to prepare to fight Muslims who were once again the enemy. While Hindu nationalists massacred Muslims, Muslim League extremists butchered Hindus. Gandhi was horrified. He began a fast in Calcutta, which he vowed to continue until the violence stopped. He refused to relinquish his vision of an India where the two communities could live in friendship and peace. And Gandhi was watching all this. He was doing his best. He went to uh, East Bengal. He walked around the villages which, where the Muslims had massacred the Hindu landlords. 
and he talked to the Muslims. He really put his life on the line. He went without any protection, just a few of his followers walking on foot. Uh, and he managed to persuade the Muslims there that it was not, not right to do this. As he walked, people would throw glass pieces on the way. They would throw uh, excreta in his path. And his answer to that was to even remove the very simple sandals which he used to uh, wear in order to walk and start walking barefoot. This had a tremendous moral uh, impact. And the parallel that we like to draw is between in the Christian tradition, the crucifixion of Christ that is suffering for humanity, tormenting the flesh in order to make the moral uh, appeal. Uh, and then uh, there is other retaliation by, by Muslims um, in, in, in East Bengal, where they're in the majority, they turn on Hindus and attack them, massacre many. Then Hindus in Bihar turn on, uh, on, on, on the Muslims. Um, and, and, and again, they do the same in, in, in UP. And then in the Punjab, uh, we see the Muslims retaliating by attacking the Sikhs and killing a lot of Sikhs in um, March 1947. So the, the, the whole thing is blowing up in, in a way that's becoming really completely uncontrollable. In March 1947, Lord Louis Mountbatten arrived in Delhi. As the last Viceroy of India, he'd been tasked by the British Prime Minister to negotiate an exit deal with Indian leaders. Mountbatten appeared bent on hastening the end of imperial rule and soon came to favour the option of partition. Gandhiji said again and again, leave India to anarchy, but don't partition it. We will sort it out. Once you are gone, then we will see how to do it. But the British said we will go only after you decide who should get what. And that is how partition became absolutely inevitable. So Gandhiji went to the extent of saying that partition could only take place on his dead body. Uh, and then, of course, the Congress leaders decided that they would uh, accept the demand for partition. They felt that Jinnah was able to stir up so much trouble for them that if they didn't concede that demand for a separate nation state of Pakistan, then he would, he would cause terrible disruption within, within India after independence and perhaps compromise the integrity of the new Indian nation state. It would perhaps collapse. Sir Cyril Radcliffe was appointed chairman of the Boundary Commission in charge of equitably carving a Muslim majority state from British India. He was assisted by two Hindus and two Muslims because he himself knew nothing of India. That was why he'd been chosen to guarantee objectivity and fairness. Most of India's Muslims lived in the north. The plan called for the creation of one state with two territories, East and West Pakistan, located 2,000 kilometers apart. But Hindu and Muslim communities in Bengal and Punjab were inextricably mixed. Drawing borders was an exercise in absurdity. On August 15, 1947, the partition between India and Pakistan was made official. As the clock had approached midnight, Jawaharlal Nehru, the first Prime Minister of Independent India, addressed the nation. Long years ago, we made a tryst with destiny, and now the time comes when we shall redeem our pledge. At the stroke of the midnight hour, when the world sleeps, India will awake to life and freedom. But the very morning after independence celebrations, Hindus in Pakistan and Muslims in India began to flee their homes. Muslims headed for Pakistan, while Hindus set off for India. Enormous convoys of people moving in opposite directions. The greatest mass migration in history. 10 million people were displaced. Many were attacked by robbers and armed militants along the way. A million people lost their lives. No one took responsibility for the tragedy. But Hindu nationalists accused Gandhi of allowing Muslims to steal part of the Hindu nation. We went to the Delhi headquarters of the right-wing Hindu Mahasabha organization. There, we spoke to its then president, who maintained that his was the only group that sought to defend India's integrity. 
Akhil Bharat Hindu Mahasabha was the only organization in India which advocated with uh, full courage and uh, expressions that uh, we shall never tolerate division of India. We want united India, one India. So although the Hindu nationalists you know, claimed that this was a vivisection of India uh, and, and it was something that the, the Congress had uh, betrayed the Indian people in agreeing to, uh, in fact it was very much a part of their own programme uh, to have a separate state and it's always served their interests subsequently to have a separate Pakistan state which is always in antagonism to India as always a, rep a representation really of, uh, of, of India's other, its opponent. A few months after independence, the new states waged their first war over Kashmir, a province with a Muslim majority but a Hindu Maharaja. The two sides agreed to a ceasefire along what's known as the line of control. It divided the region in two, with one side administered by India and the other by Pakistan. Of the three officially declared wars between India and Pakistan, two have been over Kashmir, and it remains a flashpoint to this day. On September the 9th, 1947, Gandhi moved into the Delhi home of his friend, the industrialist and Congress party supporter, Ganshyam Das Birla. In January of the following year, Gandhi began another indefinite fast, saying he would only eat if he saw a plan to stop the continuing violence. Hindus who had fled persecution in Pakistan were dumbfounded by Gandhi's empathy for Muslims, which was inherent in the second indirect goal of his fasting. Gandhi's hunger strike was also aimed at forcing the Indian government to release Pakistan's share of assets from the treasury of British India. Gandhiji, that stood in favor of Pakistan and said that I shall go on hunger strike, I shall die and the 55 crores should be given. Then only I shall release my fast. At that moment, some youths like me decided, you will not die of hunger strike, you will die of bullets now. Hindu nationalists found it scandalous that Gandhi would fast to ensure India respected the financial clauses of the partition agreement and transfer 550 million rupees to a country that had launched armed cross-border raids on Kashmir. So on the 20th of January, there was an attempt. Uh, as far as I remember, seven of the accused were present at the player meeting. They were Nathuram Gorse, Narayan Apte, Vishnu Karkare, Madanlal Pahwa, and Gopal Gorse, that is myself. The attack of January 20th was botched. Gopal Gorse was unable to reach the window from which he planned to fire his gun. He hadn't thought of bringing a ladder. So I right from the window. I could not reach my hand also. It was so high, even inside. So that was for half a minute or so. So I just came out. Zadarlal asked to ignite a gun cotton slab near the boundary wall. He did it. Then he was caught by the police. Further actions did not take place. So we all ran away from the place. The group fled back to Pune to plan a renewed attack. Their accomplice, who'd set off the homemade bomb, was arrested. Under interrogation, he revealed the names of his co-conspirators. Even now, there is debate in India as to why police failed to apprehend the men for 10 days.
Mahatma Gandhi used to sit in the manor, as you can see in this picture. This was taken on 29 January on the eve of his passing away. He would address, people would be sitting here, some would be very angry with him, that they would think, I mean, I don't know, there was a thinking amongst them that Bapu did not do enough to prevent the partition. On the 30th of January, Nathuram himself uh, arranged for a, a pistol, automatic pistol, and went to the prayer ground, evening at 5 o'clock, or five, maybe five minutes uh, late. The column indicates the exact spot where Gandhi fell, was felled by the assassin's bullet. The assassin lay in waiting for the Mahatma in this corner. As the Mahatma reached this spot to go there, he stepped forward. He took three steps, bowed before Mahatma Gandhi, and he shot him point blank three bullets. And if you see the photograph of Mahatma Gandhi with the bullets, it's almost, you know, it looks like a garland. It's almost in a semicircle. The assassin garlanded Mahatma Gandhi with bullets. And I think at that one moment, Mahatma Gandhi rose from the ashes from the earth and he became larger than life. In a radio broadcast, Nehru announced the news of Gandhi's death. The light has gone out of our lives and there is darkness everywhere. Nehru banned the movements he held responsible for Gandhi's assassination. The Hindu Masaba and the Hindu volunteer organization, the RSS. 20,000 RSS militants were jailed. Gandhi's supporters targeted the Brahmins of Maharashtra, the caste to which the assassin Godsi belonged, and which was closely associated with the Hindu Masaba and the RSS. The trial of Gandhi's assassins was held at the Red Fort, a highly symbolic location. It was there that Nehru had made his first speech to independent India, and to this day, the Prime Minister addresses crowds from the Red Fort on Independence Day. India is a democracy. The defendants had the right to a fair trial. The trial at the Red Fort offered Nathuram Godse the perfect platform to air his views. He refused legal defense, and though he had lawyers, he pleaded his own case. He stated that he had owed it to his Hindu faith and the Bhagavad Gita, which justified violence. He said he had been compelled to take action for the nation of Hindus, which Gandhi had betrayed. He needed to rid the nation of this man who persisted in weakening India's stance vis-à-vis -vis Pakistan. He described the assassination as a salutary act undertaken in the public interest, not the rash deed of a lunatic, but rather a deed motivated by political realism which had been well thought out and planned. On the 10th of February 1949, the judgment was there. Nathuram Gorsi, Narayan Apte were hanged. Madan Lal Baba, Vishnu Karkare and myself were sentenced to life. Amid a resurgence of fundamentalism in India, nationalist groups like the Hindu Masaba are enjoying a revival. At its Delhi headquarters, there is a statue of its late leader, Vinayak Damodar Savarkar, 
a contemporary of Gandhi's and a nationalist, but one with a very different ideology. Savarkar spawned the idea of Hindutva, or Hinduness, a concept that inseparably links the Hindu and Indian identity. Nathuram Godse himself said that I have murdered Gandhi. Take me for arrest. There is no question. Nathuram Godse belonged to Hindu Mahasabha, no doubt, but Hindu Mahasabha was not belonged to Gandhi murder. This is the decision of High Court. Hindu Mahasabha has no part in the murder of Gandhi. There was a very close link between the leader of the Hindu Mahasabha and the assassin, the main assassin and the main organizer of the conspiracy of the uh, Mahatma. And uh, Nathuram Godse had been a close associate of Savarkar for at least a decade before the assassination. And this man, Savarkar, was directly involved, not just ideologically or inspiring, but directly involved in the conspiracy to murder uh, Mahatma Gandhi. Savarkar in a group photo with the conspirators. He was also arrested and tried, but denied all charges and was acquitted. Gandhi, lui -même. Gandhi himself said after the first assassination attempt, Maybe the assailant is right. Maybe I am a nuisance in independent India. This is the classical Greek tragedy in its purest form, where victim and assassin have a secret understanding. Gandhi felt deep despair. His method and his cause had failed. Despite his efforts, violence between Hindus and Muslims continued, and despite his efforts, India was fractured in two. What use was he alive now? Gandhi had envisioned an independent India that was self-sufficient and predominantly agrarian. Nehru's approach was more grounded in economic reality. He aimed to combat economic stagnation and dire poverty with state-centered planning and industrialization that relied on domestic industry. After independence, uh, Nehru went all out for you know, the modernization of India, the economic modernization uh, in, in developing large-scale industries, uh, in building large dams, which he uh, described as the new temples to India, um, which would re replace you know, the older temples. It, it's difficult to know how Gandhi would have responded to this had he been alive after 1948. Um, and it's likely that Gandhi and Nehru would have come into uh, some conflict over this because Nehru didn't really put very much into trying to um, maintain the, the Gandhian uh, pro economic program. To this day, Gandhi disciples gather on Fridays to spin cotton at his cremation site. The same hand wheel, the same motions as back then, when cotton was spun to create the basis for economic independence. Today, it's more a ritual than a lesson in economic theory. Gandhi's principle of self-sufficiency did prevail until the early 1990s. Measures like high tariff walls and exchange rate management protected domestic industry from foreign competition. But over the past few decades, the country has really opened up to the forces of globalization. A growing middle class shops at new malls. Are these the temples of India today? If Gandhi returned to India today, he would be aghast to see how far the country, particularly the middle class, has succumbed to Western consumerism. 
He preached the importance of self-sufficiency for each village, the defense of the weak, and a form of asceticism according to such dictates as don't consume more than you need, respect nature. There was a clear environmental subtext to Gandhi's message. On March the 12th, 2005, 10 months after returning to power, India's Congress party marked the 75th anniversary of the Salt March. Hundreds of people walked in the Mahatma's footsteps, following the same 358-kilometer route for 26 days. Marches donned traditional white khadi clothing made of homespun cotton and the iconic Gandhi cap. The great-grandson of Jawaharlal Nehru, Rahul Gandhi, was 35 at the time of the procession and had only recently entered politics. He would go on to become party president. He joined the marches as they reached the coast in Gujarat, 75 years to the day that Mahatma Gandhi shook the British Empire to its core by harvesting a handful of salt. Whether on 35 mm film or on digital video, the cameras captured the same scene. Globalization has swept aside many of Gandhi's principles, but the Mahatma's fundamental message has endured, a message that speaks of the power of peace, forgiveness and freedom, and can transcend even the hatred that killed him.